which is set down by the Australian government, which is very similar to um, biodiesel standards used in Europe. And so no matter what the quality of the oil we start off with, we always end up with, the, um, with a very similar product. Because biodiesel is vegetable and not fossil in origin, the carbon dioxide produced by burning it is absorbed by growing plants, making it carbon neutral. And it's better for engines too. This is in here, John. Well, she looks what? pretty clean from this angle. Well, this has done 80,000 kilometres. Every kilometre has been done on biodiesel. The oil hasn't been changed in this in 11,000 kilometres. Yeah, you know, you'd be familiar with diesel oh, yeah. oils. Yeah, absolutely. That's crystal clear, and that's 11,000 kilometres. Diesel oil is generally jet black. Um, this won't lose its colour or its viscosity for another 10,000. So you've got none of this carbon that you'd usually find in your oil in your engine. Okay, so the the carbon's gone. They say your engines will last three times as long. Well, that's pretty incredible when you. It is incredible. Six down there. There's six and a half tonnes. We can take a tonne and a half over here. In fact, the product is so successful that the company struggles to meet demand. Today, there's no biodiesel available. Unloading right now, but he oh, just right, said yeah. he, uh, that there's no fuel till Friday. It's all been but sold. Melinda Cox is a local customer oh, who's happy to wait. Yeah. How long have you been using it? Oh, we've been using it for about 12 months. It's oh. been fantastic. The car, we haven't used it in this car, but we use it in the, in the four-wheel drive. It's been brilliant. It's um, so much cheaper, way better for the, um, for the car. The, the oil is just clear. It's quite weird. I was surprised. And it's like, yeah. well, hey, if you run on it from right yeah. from word go, you'd Excellent. never ever have to change your oil. That's, it's got to um, be a plus. Yeah, absolutely. Saves the hip pocket well, and the country. From the talks with Rod over there with the biodiesel, I'm, I'm convinced that, that all those doubts are now gone. And I'd say we be, will be having our, you know, dial diesel definitely next week. John Rumney runs an ecotourism business in Port Douglas, Northern Australia. He's worked alongside the Great Barrier Reef for over 30 years and believes that it's now under serious threat from global warming. Everyone comes here because it's nature tourism. And if we don't have a healthy environment, then we won't have anything to show these people, and they'll go to Disneyland. Professor Ove Hogelberg is one of the world's leading experts on coral reefs and climate change. He's been working with John and other tour operators to find ways of managing the reef that won't damage the coral or local business. Well, I've had some of the best dives this year. They were fantastic. Osprey Reef, you know, we had hammerheads. Wow. But you're starting to see more bleaching. You know, a couple years ago, 5 to 10 percent, a bit more now. I'm worried. But the, the important point, though, is that it's still a fantastically beautiful ecosystem. And really, it's these little worrying signs that we're all starting to notice from science, tour operators, and so on. And of course, the projections into the future that suggest that these might increase. I think it's very important that we start to work um, together. And I've learnt a lot from working with industry, in that while we have to advise governments as scientists, actually industry has the longest term investment in the reef and is looking for the sustainability and I, and I think that's been an interesting lesson. Uh, you're looking for you know better ways. I feel guilty going out to the reef burning all these dinosaurs <laughs> you know fossil fuels for fun, <laughs> and all the airplane fuel yeah. to get the people here and you're going and yet you're trying to make a positive difference by the science and ecotourism. It's really a two-pronged strategy isn't it? it you know we've got to go with our new lobby group through the you know the liaison between science and tour operators and reef management we've got to make the point to the government that they have to change their international stance clearly but at the same time we've got to have those local solutions otherwise you know we're not going to get anywhere Ove Hogelberg shares John Rumney's concern for this fragile ecosystem since 1979, we've had um, seven major uh, bleaching events that have stretched up and down the Great Barrier Reef. In the last few years, these have uh, increased in size and severity. So that in 1998 and in 2002, we saw 60% of the reefs on the Great Barrier Reef affected, um, moderately to severely. And of course, uh, after that, we had about 5 to 10% of the coral dying. 
One of the most critical things to realise is that coral is, is a framework building organism. It builds the reef and the habitats in which possibly over a million species live. Now, many of those species are dependent on coral for that habitat and food. So when we contemplate vast changes in the survivorship of corals on reefs, we're also contemplating huge domino effects through the ecosystem where we start to lose the species that depend on corals. Those impacts we don't know much about yet, but they're likely to be quite huge. It's very important to put the current pace and magnitude of change in the context of what's happened to the Earth in the past. Many people will point to the fact that, yes, the Earth has heated and cooled between ice ages and interglacials. So going back and looking at the data sets that tell us what the temperature was and the CO2 content gives us a lot of information about the, the scale of the change that we're having right now. What they tell us is something very interesting. Past changes um, going from glacial to interglacial warm periods were possibly as much as two orders of magnitude slower than what we're seeing today. And that of course is the big problem. The rate of change is outstripping the ability of biological systems to keep pace with it. We trust scientists to tell us about what the best medicines are, to develop new technologies, to put planes in the air and so on. But what's really curious about the climate, our response to climate change science, is that we somehow find that doubtful. This is after droves of scientists have come to us. And what it becomes clear is that we can't cherry pick science. This science is as good as the science that puts medicine on the shelves and planes in the air. And we've got to take note of it because it's telling us that there are some very drastic and challenging times ahead. And if we don't wake up now, we'll regret it forever. John Romney has worked in the great outdoors all his life and made sure that his three daughters grew up with an appreciation for the natural world. But middle daughter Jenna had a particularly strong affinity for animals. She was really small. You know, I said, Jenna, what are you going to be when you grow up? And she goes, a horse. And she meant it. But always a joy. You almost can't think of Jenna without smiling for her love of life. Jenna has grown up to share her father's love for the Great Barrier Reef, so much so that she's now a marine biologist. I was very lucky because the reef was like my playground. I think I could snorkel before I could walk. Most of my earliest memories um, are of the Great Barrier Reef. It's my favourite place in the world to be. I feel like it's my home. Um, I'm the happiest when I'm underwater out at sea and I love the, the taste of the salt water and the wind and everything so it's very close to my heart. Uh, it's very important that the reef survives because we're so lucky to have it in the first place. It's the cradle of biodiversity, it's such um, a magical natural resource and it has so much to offer tourists and visitors and researchers um, and we want to keep it alive so that future generations can experience it. I think the threat that the reef is facing is very serious. We're seeing the changes over a short period of time. It's a real worry and it's happening, it's happening right now and it's happening at an alarming rate. So to keep ignoring it I think is immoral. Australia and America said they didn't want to do it because it was no point because of the third yeah. world. But built into that whole proposal... Australia has been reluctant to join international initiatives on climate change. It's refused to commit to reducing its carbon emissions. These gases are a major contribution to global warming and Jenna Romney would like to see a more positive response. And I think Australians are very relaxed. We're renowned for being relaxed around the world and that's a good quality in a lot of ways. But I think with regard to global issues, we kind of just think if we sit back for long enough, someone else will deal with the problem or a group of greenies or um, scientists will come up with a quick fix uh, to stop global warming. But that's not the case, there is no magical cure and each of us has to take it upon ourselves to be proactive and do something about it. It's a sentiment shared by her father, John Romney, who left the US for Australia over 30 years ago to immerse himself in the country's wildlife. I've often said that the Great Barrier Reef is this fantastic resource and if Australia can't manage it for fishing and the issues and the impacts that are hitting it, then there's no hope because they're intelligent, they have the wealth, and they have lack of population and they have the great resources. So it's an indictment of their failure if they don't do it. <laughs>